wood mulch can be very beneficial for fruit trees. So lots of growers spread wood mulch over the roots of their trees. And often they do this in the early spring. So there are so many benefits to doing this. Wood mulch helps keep moisture in the soil that tree roots can get access to. It insulates the soil and that can protect the roots from extreme temperatures. And wood mulch can suppress weeds. It can even improve soil quality by adding organic matter to the soil as it decomposes. So all of that is terrific. But what if you get your wood mulch from a local arborist? And what if that mulch comes from a diseased tree? Will that disease affect your tree? Now, any fruit grower will know how damaging fruit tree diseases can be. So these are all really important questions, and we're going to discuss them on the show today. My guest today is Linda Chalker Scott. She's a professor of horticulture at Washington State University, and she is the award-winning author of six books. And one of them is one of my favorites, How Plants Work, The Science Behind the Amazing Things That Plants Do. So I'm going to chat with Linda in just a moment. And at the end of the show, we also have another surprise guest on the show. But first, I want to hear from you. Do you use, ar do you use arborist mulch to mulch your fruit trees? What are your experiences? And would you be concerned if the mulch came from a diseased tree? Send in your questions or comments, or you can just even email us to say hi. Our email is info, I-N-F-O, at orchardpeople.com. That's info at orchardpeople.com. And remember to include your first name and where you're writing from. I really look forward to hearing from you soon. So, Linda, welcome to the show today. Well, thanks, Susan. It's fun to be here. Um, so let's set the scene first. I want to start with the simplest question of all. What exactly is wood mulch? Well, wood mulch um, can be a lot of different things. And so I try to be really specific when I talk about beneficial wood mulches, and I refer to them as arborist wood chips. So these are chips that are fresh off the truck after a tree or branches have been chipped up. And that's what I refer to when I'm talking about wood mulch. There's a lot of other wood mulches too that may or may not be very beneficial. These include things like hog fuel or bark or other types of material that are made from, from wood of some sort. But the ones that have been shown to be most beneficial from a research perspective um, are the ones that are literally fresh off the chipper truck. Okay, interesting. But garden centers, I, you know, you go to a garden center and I know not too long ago, I went to a garden center, there were these big things of wood mulch there was the natural cedar mulch, and then there was black mulch and red mulch. What is that then? Most of the stuff you're going to find in bags is bark mulch. And so it's just what's been stripped off um, logs before they go to a mill and get made into lumber. And so that's just the outer co covering of the tree. And unfortunately um, for us, in terms of using it as a mulch, is that bark has a really specific function or many functions. And one of the functions is to keep water inside the living tree. So there's a lot of waxes that are impregnated into the bark material. So the problem is if you make a mulch that's only out of this outer covering, you end up having a mulch that is pretty water repellent. It doesn't absorb water and it doesn't really um, allow itself to be become part of the soil system. So in other words, you're not gonna find fungi growing in it very quickly. You're not gonna find little fine roots growing in it. It just is this kind of inert material sitting on top of the soil. Wow, so you're saying these bags, like how, how do they get bark into these bags of mulch? Like they peel bark off trees and then they do something else with the, the rest of the tree? Like it doesn't make sense. Well, this is, this is it's a material that's from the timber industry. So for the timber industry's perspective, all they want is the wood so they can make lumber out of it. And what's left over is a waste product. And so uh, several decades ago, you know, they're looking at ways of, of reusing this material rather than, you know, putting it in landfill, which is, which is good. Um, and some marketing uh, guru came up with the term beauty bark, which is highly popular. It's nice and alliterative. And it has the word beauty in it. And so this is supposed to be a beautiful thing. And I will say that that, that bark mulch can be very attractive because it's it's uniformly textured, it's uniform color, um, but it does not have much in the way of benefits to soils or roots. 
Gotcha. Okay. So beauty bark, we don't want that, the bagged stuff. Uh, um, so let's see. Now we got a question here from Steve from NYC, New York City. Hello, Susan and guest. Can I use just regular sawdust for my mulch? Thank you. Well, the problem with sawdust and other really finely textured mulches is that the deeper that you lay it down as a mulch, the more it restricts water and oxygen movement because the pore space in between the particles is so small that things don't move through it uh, very easily. And so what happens is that you have water that can't percolate through, oxygen can't get through. And so the deeper that layer of very finely chipped material is, the harder it is for the soil to literally breathe. So I don't recommend using sawdust. I don't see any problem with, with mixing it into uh, a wood chip mulch, especially if you've got some extra and you'd rather than throw it away, you want to put it on your landscape, but it doesn't make a good mulch by itself. Gotcha. We've got an email from Tate. Not sure where Tate is from. From And Tate asks, is colored mulch bad? You know, that black or red mulch? Um, as far as I understand, at least the way that mulches are made now, is the materials that they, they use for the colorants are not toxic. And so they're, they're perfectly fine to have um, on, on the mulch on the landscape. They won't, it won't stay that color forever. It will get bleached out and they'll get to what, go back to whatever um, color the material originally was. So short answer is, is no, the, the color is fine, but it's not a, it's not a permanent thing. Okay. And then Irene uh, writes from Erie, Pennsylvania, is mulch treated for bugs and parasites prior to bagging? Ooh, that brings in an extra issue, doesn't it? Because if you're buying these bags of mulch, maybe it's got chemicals in it too. Well, it's my understanding that the, that the bark mulch, now again, wood chips are not bagged. And so the material that I recommend, the Orpish wood chips, you're not going to find in bags. Um, but material that is bagged, um, if it's, it's usually composted first and the composting process gets rid of a lot of the problems. I would caution you about using recycled or reclaimed wood. Make sure you know where it's come from because sometimes uh, manufacturers will chip up pallets and other types of wood things that may be treated with insecticides, especially if things are being shipped from other countries. And so you don't, you certainly don't want to use treated wood. And so that's another benefit from my perspective about using the Arbor's wood chips because it's wood that has not been treated with anything. Okay, so let's dig into arborist wood chips. I'm excited to learn more about that. So talk to me about where it comes from. The arborists are out. They are, you know, trimming trees. They're working with trees. What part of the tree are we getting when we get arborist wood mulch? Well, it depends on what the arborists are doing. And so anytime you see an arborist out doing trimming or taking a tree down or anything like that, you'll see generally around them, there'll be a chipper and then there'll be a blower and then there'll be a truck. And so the material goes through the chipper, gets blown into the truck, um, and hopefully getting delivered to, to your garden. Um, the chips are usually only made from branches and you know smaller diameter materials. You can't put a whole log through a chipper. And so you're getting primarily branches, large branches. And the nice thing about that is you're also getting the leaves of the needles that are on there. And that's an extra benefit in terms of um, a, a quick burst of nutrients once the material is down on your soil. So it's generally just uh, branches of any size, um, as well as the leaves or whatever else happened to be on those branches. Okay, so now we get our mulch from, from the arborist. Let's say they dump a big bunch of mulch on our front doorstep somewhere, on our, our parking pad or our driveway, and we're going to mulch with it. Um, what happens when you lay this stuff out on your garden, and how would that different how would that be different from using the mulch or the beauty bark that we get uh, from garden centers? Okay, so that's a, it's a good comparison to make. So the, the bag stuff, you, you get, you lay it down, and it will last a long time. It doesn't break down very rapidly, and you're not going to see um, much in, in the way of anything growing into it. And, and by that, I mean, if you if you get into it and kind of pull apart your hands, you're not gonna find little roots, you're not gonna find mycorrhizae, it's gonna be just kind of this material sitting on top of the soil. So, I mean, it does have some benefits. I mean, most mulches have some benefits, but the difference with the arborist wood chips is that, you know, until recently this was living tissue and then it got all chopped up. And so now you have moist living tissue that's full of um, various types of microbes 
all, almost all of them beneficial. There are exceptions to that. We can talk about the disease issue in a little bit, but it's just this very nutrient rich, uh, microbial rich material that immediately uh, starts imparting benefits to the soil. And so it's just, it, it rehydrates the soil. Nice thing about the chips is that they absorb and release water slowly. And if you think about this, this is the same thing that happens, you know, in a forest system is that, you know, you see branches and other things fall into the ground, they begin to decompose and you, we call that a duff layer. And so this is just how we mimic what happens in a natural forest by creating a duff layer of, of arborist chips. Now, how do you, you spell that duff? Do you? F-F, -F, yeah. Duff D layer. D -F -F. Yeah, it's I, not, and... beer, not the beer, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the mulch. D-U-F-F. -F. So what is it? Why is there a technical term for this? What is that explaining to us? It's just it's just a term that's used and I'm not sure how technical it is. But when, when uh, especially in, in ecology, you know, when you're looking at forest systems and you're looking at that top layer, it's usually called a duff layer. Duff layer. Well, I, yeah. that's great. Never knew that. Um, we have an, uh, an email here from Howie. Howie asks, is leaf mulch OK to use? No contest today. Question. And we are listening to you from Dover, Delaware. And thank you so much. For, I love it when people tell me where they're from. Uh, so uh, just to answer, no, there is no contest today. Um, for the time being, no contest. Too much work for me, guys. <laughs> so for now, no contest. But great question. Is leaf mulch okay to use? Leaf mulch is great. And I always keep all of my leaves from my own landscape and use them as part of my mulch layer. But as, as we found by, by really researching what wood chip mulches do, um, the mycorrhizal fungi and other beneficial fungi really only um, get their nutri nutrients from decomposing wood. So uh, uh, leaf mulches are very bacterial rich, but they don't have the fungal richness that we need too. So the best thing is to have both. And that's again, why the, the arborist chips are so great because depending on you know, when you're getting the, the chips made, um, you'll have leaves or needles in there that will, you know, add um, those same great things that you get from a leaf mulch, but they're 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 mixed up with the wood, so you don't have that just that that one layer of of, of leaf mulch. Awesome. Okay, I'm just going to quickly look at the YouTube live feed, and I want to say hello to everybody. Uh, Ryan, hello. Uh, Flomaton, is that your name? Hello, Nadim. Hello, Eric. It's lovely to see you. Um, and let's see, is that Sean? Hi, from Ottawa, Canada. Ivy Orchard. How about straw pine shavings that are soiled with chicken manure? Would the nitrogen breakdown be okay? What a great question. I think that's Sharon. Okay, so just to be clear, that so this is um, uh, wood shavings that were used as poultry bedding, correct? It looks like it's straw and pine shavings. Yes. Okay. So straw mixed with some pine gotcha. shavings. Okay. So again, it's a little bit too finely textured to, to function in the same way that a, a coarse wood chip mulch does. Um, I'm all for reusing materials when we can. I would be cautious with the, with the poultry manure. It tends to be very high in phosphate. So I always suggest that before you use... Um, something that, that is a rich source of organic material like manures that you have to do a soil test and make sure you already don't have too much of, of all the essential nutrients. Um, if you do, adding more is going to cause problems. And so be, um, love using the stuff. You may just want to compost it and use it as part of a compost system. But before you put it down as a mulch, do be sure that you're not um, you know, creating a problem with, with uh, too many nutrients. Yeah, it's a great point about chicken manure. Like if it's fresh, I, I think it can burn tree roots as well. So composting is probably a super idea. Um, and that is Shannon. Uh, so nice to see you too. Okay, we've got a question here from Brida. Uh, so hi, Susan and Linda. Should we add or mix anything to the mulch that we buy, i.e. fertilizer? We love you from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, Brida. I, I never suggest adding fertilizer automatically unless you have a soil test that says you need something. And I can't overemphasize the importance of a soil test just to get a baseline. And the analogy I like to use is that, for instance, um, if you're not feeling well, you know, you don't go to a nutrient supplement store and buy one of everything and start taking it. 
right? You go in and you have some tests done to find out if you've got an iron deficiency or something else, and then you can take the specific supplements you need. So it's the same thing with our soils. We don't want to just add fertilizer because we think we should. We need to find out what we have enough of already and then just add what's needed. So it never really hurts, um, you know, if you like to do a top dressing of nitrogen, you know, once or maybe even twice a year with vegetable gardens, it would be more than for landscapes. Um, but you don't want to just add everything and you don't want to use uh, complete fertilizer because those are really based on agricultural production, annual crops, and we are not managing annual crops. We're looking at landscapes and orchards and things that are long lived. Okay, so the, the one reason people are drawn to garden centers to get their mulch is they kind of know what they're getting. Um, when you have an arborist deposit wood chips on your front lawn, you don't know where it came from. And those of us who care for fruit trees, we many of us realize that keeping the the our orchards clean from pathogens is really important. So if we see a cherry tree that has a branch that has black knot, we will carefully and correctly remove that branch, take it off the site, not put it in our compost to continue spreading the pathogen. So, uh, you know, that is a concern for growers. Saying that, however, there are lots of diseases that fruit trees don't get. So let's start gently and say that if, for instance, in that delivery of wood mulch, the tree is a maple tree that had some terrible fungal disease and it includes leaves with spots on them and whatever, would you be concerned, Linda? Not at all. And um, I'm never worried about either diseased wood or diseased leaves that might be in there. And, and the reason for that is, is because, you know, those of us that are working like your group, you know, working in orchards and you know your diseases really well, you know that there is a disease triangle, that you have to have the pathogen, you have to have a host, and then you have to have the right environmental conditions. So what happens with the wood chip mulch, it creates such a healthy soil condition that especially if you're looking at rot types of things, you're not going to have problems because the conditions aren't right for rot organisms. It's too oxygenated. So with, with a wood chip mulch, you're, you're going to automatically have you know, kind of um, a whole palette of beneficial, or at least, you know, neutral microbes, both bacterial and fungal. And they're going to provide um, a, a competition with, with, uh, with pathogens for attaching to roots if they happen to be around roots. Um, you're not gonna have a, a material that's in a mulch that's able somehow to trans transfer itself several inches below the mulch to find roots to attack. But you know you can have fine roots that eventually will grow up into the material. We all know spores are everywhere. Um, they're not active for the most part. So if if you don't have uh, poor environmental conditions, um, you're not going to have to worry about it. And the work that's been done looking at um, primarily things like phytophthora and armillaria, um, these types of, of of organisms that become problems in poorly oxygenated, compacted, poorly drained soils. Um, they don't. They don't infect trees that are that have been, that, you know, that, that are in uh, contact with a chip made from those uh, disease materials. So all the literature I've seen up until now um, just doesn't support uh, any concern in terms of having uh, the, the pathogens that have been tested. Again, these are primarily rot pathogens um, having any kind of effect on the roots of healthy trees. And I like how you're bringing forward really like very clearly the difference between these purchased wood chips, which have kind of no life in them. Some of them are even bagged up. So there's no oxygen in there. So there couldn't be life, I suppose, or not good, healthy life in there. Um, so then you've got those. And then these arborous wood chips, which already have some moisture in them. They already have some mi microbes in there. So this is something very different. Am I, am I, have I got it right, Linda? Absolutely. You've got, you've got a little, a little um, my, microcosm um, of, of life that is already there in, in, in the mulch material. You don't have to inoculate. You don't have to do anything. You just have to put it down. And if it's during the summer, obviously, you know, it's going to require some, some water as, as all landscapes do, but that's, that's it. Okay, so now let's take a step into slightly more controversial territory. If I'm growing apple trees and the tree that came down is one that is suffering, maybe it's still alive, it's not totally dead and it was suffering from fire blight, very infectious bacterial disease. 
and it's all chipped up in and then it's put in you know by the chipper and then the arborist comes and dumps it in my orchard and my you know my garden with my fruit trees or perhaps it's a plum tree with black knot and i have plum trees what happens there i mean clearly th this tree may have come from the other side of the city and now it's in pieces in my front yard should i be concerned I guess if you're worried about it, and especially things like fire blight, as you mentioned, is, is very infectious. And I might be tempted to, you know, to ask, first of all, when you're getting chips, if there is any of those types of disease materials. But, you know, we have to look at this on what happens in nature. You know, trees get diseased naturally. They drop diseased branches naturally. They're around other members of their own species naturally. And not everything is going to die. Um, a lot of these things are opportunistic diseases. They, they attack things that, that are already... Um, stressed, and especially in urban environments, you know, and urban stresses are, are pretty significant for a lot of different um, plants that we have, trees and otherwise. So if we have a tree that's going to be susceptible to that, um, yeah, I might be a little cautious. So let's say, for instance, you know, that you're, you're trying to um, do some rejuvenation of, of a landscape that hasn't been taken care of very well and the trees are struggling. I might be more cautious about making sure that the, the mulch I'm getting um, doesn't have, uh, you know, things that had leaf or crown types of diseases. Again, the, 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 the root diseases aren't an issue. The issue would be more, um, you know, spores splattering up onto leaves or, 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 you know, parts of the tree that would be susceptible. But again, so that, that is something I would um, worry about if I had trees that, that I thought would be susceptible to disease. Um, if not, I, I think that trees typically, um, their leaves are typically covered with a lot of beneficial microbes. And in fact, that's a lot of the way that they are resistant anyway, is that they, like our skin is covered with, you know, uh, things that aren't pathogens. And when we get cuts in our skin, then we have problems in terms of getting infections. So, you know, we, we have natural coverings for, to protect us. Trees have natural coverings. And as long as they're healthy, I don't think there's a risk. But well, abundance of caution when things are not healthy and are struggling, then I would be more cautious with what I put down. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Another quick question. Um, this is from George. Hi, ladies. Should mulch be used for all trees? What about plants? Thanks from Dallas, Texas. Good question, because we are specifically talking about fruit trees, but what about other trees? Any woody plants you have are going to benefit from wood chip mulch because that's what they're they're used to anyway in terms of a natural ground covering and most woody plants are mycorrhizal and so you have to have that wood chip mulch to to really nourish the mycorrhizae i'm going to take it even farther um, i have herbaceous perennials i have a vegetable garden i use wood chips on everything so the problem is is that there's not a whole lot of research um, out there there's a lot on trees because you know, trees and mulching is kind of important, especially in, in urban areas where you have street trees and things. Trees and herbaceous perennials, I mean, I'm sorry, mulch and herbaceous perennials, mulch and vegetable gardens. Um, there is some data out there um, and it's very supportive. And I know a lot of people anecdotally that use use it as well as I do um, on our, our beds and our and our um, vegetable gardens um, as, a, as a really superior way of, of suppressing weeds, retaining water, and all those good things that wood chips can do. Okay, we got a great question from Jeff. I'm really gl gl glad that Jeff asked this. Hi, Susan, this is Jeff from Colorado listening live. I have 15 apple and pear trees that are one to three years old. At 8,000 foot elevation, my soil is high in clay and alkalinity from calcium carbonate. On the potentially bright side, I have an ample supply of willow and aspen for wood chips. How would adding willow and aspen chips affect the soil and orchard health, either positively or negatively? And Jeff, before I hand this over to Linda, you have got to listen to the episode that I did a while back on willow mulch and fruit trees. Oh my gosh, willow mulch is good. So, so have a listen to that, but let's hear what Linda says about that topic. Um, you're, as Susan says, um, willow mulch is great. And frankly, all mulches are great. If you can get wood, wood, you know, arborist wood chip mulches, I can't, I can't speak highly enough about them. So yes, it'll improve your soil a lot. Um, it will, surprisingly enough, will, will not cause clay soils to be wetter. What it does is it allows the, um, 
the tilth of those clay soils to regenerate so that they become more porous. And so water and oxygen move them through them more easily. The compaction will go down. So you'll find that actually your clay soils will have better tilth after mulching. Um, it's not gonna change the pH, at least not within the soil itself. It'll change the pH um, at the surface because that's where you've got you know this, these acidic uh, compounds that are right uh, in contact with the surface of the soil, but the volume of the soil is so vast that there's no mulch that's going to significantly change the pH of any soil just because the amount of mulch compared to the volume of the soil is too small. But yeah, your, your trees will love you for, for putting down those chips. So absolutely, um, it will improve your soil it will improve your tree health and you'll be really glad you did it. Awesome. Okay, a couple of quick questions here. We'll have our commercial break in just a minute. But first from Barbie, thank you. I've been using wood chips for over 20 years and my soil is becoming quite deep and rich. Question, anthracnos is a problem in Western Washington. So I guess the concern is, would that spread as well in our wood chips? Anthracnose does not spread that way. And in fact, um, and I'm in Western Washington too. So, and I'm glad to hear you've been using the wood chips for 20 years. Um, it, anthracnose tends to be one of those things that especially if you have a dry year and trees are stressed, it becomes a problem. Um, as I said, spores are everywhere and um, they're going to become a problem if, if trees are stressed. The best way to reduce tree, tree stress is to have them well mulched with arborist chips, and they're going to be much healthier, much less susceptible to things like anthracnose and those other types of um, uh, opportunistic diseases. And this is from Bob, new to apples. Jo oh, just joined the show. Important to clean up fallen leaves for my trees and containers on my patio, question mark. I'm used to using fresh green materials as mulch in pots. So is it important to clean up fallen leaves? And I'm assuming that Bob means healthy leaves. Well, it depends. Um, if you don't have, and I'll both assume they're healthy, that they don't have, they don't, that they're not diseased and are a source of spores. But you have to be really cautious with how thick those layers of leaves are. So the thicker the layers are, the more they tend to restrict water and oxygen movement. So. Um, I leave um, my leaves on my landscape and I happen to have mostly uh, oak leaves, which tend to be pretty tough and uh, slow to break down. But even so, they can tend to mat after a while. And so I tend to kind of chop those up with our, um, our lawnmower just to get them in smaller, smaller amounts and keep them on the beds. And then if you put the wood chips over the top of that, um, that keeps them from becoming compacted and it just adds, you know, the extra little uh, leaf material to, to the soil, which is always a good thing. So I, I usually have leave the leaves in place and I put chips at the top and I do the same thing in my container plants. All of my container plants have wood chips in them. And you'll be amazed at how less frequently you have to water. And just the health of the plants is, is, is amazing by just adding the wood chips as, as it protecting the soil. Wonderful. Okay, a couple of quick hellos. We've got a hello from Norway. That's from Ole Alexander. So hello from Norway, love your show. Um, uh, Bob says he uses barley straw as well. Rachel asks, thoughts about using Alanthus wood chips as mulch? Well, Alanthus um, is one of those plants that kind of gets tagged as being um, allelopathic. And I would not worry about that. There is absolutely no evidence that, that, that trees that have, um, chemicals in them naturally that can have effects on plants in petri dishes and test tubes have any kind of negative effect on landscapes. So all those chemicals that are in there that tend to be things that plants have produced for protection against what, you know, we don't know, probably 90% of them, but they break down fairly rapidly in the soil because they're, they're all organic chemicals, um, microbes break them down and use them up. And so they don't stick around at levels that would have any, make any kind of a problem for, for your landscape. So no, Atlantis chips are fine. With anything that tends to be aggressive or invasive, I will suggest make sure it's chipped up, you know, in, into pieces that are not going to re-sprout. I've seen things uh, re-sprout from, and these aren't invasive, aggressive, well, they're aggressive, but they're not invasive. Things like poplar and willow can easily re-sprout from branches that are left in the chips. And if you don't want, 
you know, volunteer trees coming in, just make sure those those little green, it's the, the, the smaller diameter green branches that can sometimes be sprout. All right. Well, we have so many more questions coming in and I want to chat about all of them. But first, are you okay, Linda, if we take a few minutes and listen to some words from our sponsors? Sure. Great. So hang on the line. And there is so much more we're going to talk about here. Plus, we have a special guest who is appearing near nearer to the end of this show. So you got to hang on the line. In the meantime, you are listening to Orchard People, a radio show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and we're also playing live on YouTube as a live stream. I'm Susan Poisner, and we'll be back right after this little break. Do you want to learn how to grow organic fruit trees quickly and successfully? I'm Susan Poisner from OrchardPeople.com, and I teach online courses. Here's some feedback from one of my happy students. My name is Jennifer Chandler, and I started growing fruit trees three years ago now. I would recommend Orchard People courses primarily because it is an excellent way to get up to speed fairly quickly and to build your confidence. There seem to be so many different theories of what to do and different recipes for this and that. One isn't overwhelmed by the advice in Orchard People. I just find it so much faster to get up to speed and build confidence than trying to piece it together surfing the web or at the library. Check out my courses at learn.orchardpeople.com. If you're listening to this show, you are passionate about fruit trees. But do you care how your trees are grown? Silver Creek Nursery is a family-owned business, and we grow our fruit trees sustainably using only organic inputs. We stock a huge range of cultivars, like Wolf River, an apple tree that produces fruit so large you can make an entire pie with just one apple. We also carry red-fleshed apples, like Pink Pearl, as well as heirloom and disease-resistant varieties of apples, pears, apricots, cherries, and more. We ship our trees across Canada, and we can also supply you with berry canes and edible companion plants to plant near your trees. At Silver Creek Nursery, we grow fruit trees for a sustainable food future. Learn more about us at silvercreeknursery.ca. If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes over 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Wiffle Tree Nursery. Call us today. Welcome back to Orchard People with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101. To contact us live, send us an email. Our email address is info at orchardpeople.com. And now, right back to your host of Orchard People, Susan Poisner. Hey, everybody, you're listening to Orchard People, a radio show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and we're also running live on YouTube. 
And I'm your host, Susan Poisner. In the show today, we've been talking to Linda Chalker Scott, professor of horticulture at Washington State University. And we've been digging deep into the topic of using arborist wood chips to mulch your fruit trees. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment, but first I would love to hear from you. If you're listening to the show live today, send us an email right now to info, that's I-N-F-O, at orchardpeople.com with your question, your comment, or just to say hello. Be sure to include your first name and where you're writing from. We look forward to hearing from you. So Linda, let's get through a few more interesting questions that we've got here. Um, we've got a question here from Ken. Hello, Susan and Linda. The advice today on the show is fabulous. Does Linda have a book out? If so, where can I purchase it? Thank you. That's Ken from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, that's a nice question. Um, I, I do have some books out. Um, I will also say, though, and I know that Susan's going to have these linked on her site, is that I also have some free publications on using arborist wood chip mulches and actually um, on comparing different types of mulches. And those are free downloads. So I'm not going to make you buy anything. But if you're interested in understanding things like how plants work, um, my training is as a um, horticultural physiologist. And so that's that's what I do is is understand how plants work in the environment. So that's been a really popular book because there's nothing else really like it on the market. And then I have a couple of books on uh, horticultural myth busting, which is how I kind of got my start with um, my outreach program. Um, I've got a book on gardening with native plants, but this is for the Pacific Northwest only. And so if, unless you're in our particular eco region, that's not going to be very, very useful. And I also have a book on sustainable gardens uh, and landscapes, which is kind of a, you know, a, a soup to nuts uh, book. And then if you happen to like uh, DVDs and you feel passionate about watching me in person for 12 hours, <laughs> the Great Courses did a series on the science of gardening um, that was really fun to do and to talk about a lot of the same types of things. Wonderful resources and how plants work, I mentioned at the top of this, this show, I love the scientific approach to gardening. The only way you can get me to do anything is if I understand why. So how plants work, re that really was helpful for me. Okay, a couple more comments from Catherine. Uh, hello, we are listeners from Omaha, Nebraska. Such fantastic information today. Thanks for the tips. Thank you so much, Catherine. Then we have an email from Les. Okay, so Les is from Connecticut. My question is, we typically add a few inches of leaf compost around the fruit tree and then cover it with a few inches of wood chips every spring. Is this a good general practice in your opinion? Should it be repeated in the fall? It's absolutely a good practice. And I, I suggest repeating it as often as, as you can in terms of keeping weeds down. So part of the benefit of the wood chips, especially if you use um, relatively deep layers, is that it really keeps weeds out, which means that more of your tree's root system has access to water and nutrients that aren't being used by the weeds. So we have fruit trees. Um, we have a fairly small orchard, but you know, I've got you know, half a dozen apple trees, a couple of pear trees, cherry trees, walnut trees, and all of them get a nice thick um, layer of wood chips that's a good, you know, good six inches from when we put it down all the way out to the drip line. And that keeps the, and these are in an orchard, and it keeps the orchard grass back um, from the trees uh, for most of the year. And then we'll just go ahead and reapply it. Um, we tend to be a little bit lazier and not do it twice a year. And so we put a thicker layer down to start with. But yes, absolutely good practice. Okay, so now let, let's get a couple of hellos. We've got a hello from John from California. Um, Ole Alexander asks about vertical mulching and is it good for loamy soil? So to you, Ole Alexander, I would love to say I have a whole show on vertical mulching that I would love for you to listen to. There is so much information there, but I'll just hand that over to you, Linda, for a quick answer. Is vertical mulching good for loamy soil? If your soil is in pretty good shape already, it's not highly compacted. Um, vertical mulching isn't really necessary. Um, I would just I would just stick with the with the you know the the horizontal version instead. But I know there's been some really good work done, especially with trees that are in uh, very harsh conditions where they get a lot of foot traffic. They don't have a lot of um, surface mulch anyway, and vertical mulching has been shown to help reduce the compaction in in, in that way. 
but overall you'll have better results if, if you can use um, a, a horizontal mulch because it covers the entire source, soil surface and has more of an impact than the vertical does. Yeah, the vertical is so great if you've got really compacted, like rock hard soil. Uh -huh. So, um, okay, another question here. Um, this is from Daryl in British Columbia. Hello, Susan and Linda. I have an apple tree that is loved by moss, woodpeckers, chickadees, and hummingbirds. Every year, the apples look nice and red, but then they have little bugs in them. It's frustrating. I'm trying to be organic. Advice, the tree came with the house, and I would feel bad to cut it down and start from scratch. Oh, my goodness. Don't cut it down, please. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Daryl, before I hand this over, go to orchardpeople.com, and I have an article on how to protect your uh, tree from insect pests and really easy ways to do that. So please don't cut down the tree. Uh, anyways, over to you, Linda. And I would, I would second that. Don't cut the tree down. We can, we can work with this. So I'm, I'm in Washington state. So I'm right next door to you. And in our state, uh, homeowners that have apple trees are highly encouraged. They can't, they can't go around with, with orchard police, but we're supposed to spray our apple trees for, for coddling moth and apple maggot because they are so destructive to commercial orchards that we need to do that to keep the, those, those two groups of pests away. So I, I, I don't like to have to spray, but this is one of those times when I do spray because it's the responsible thing to do. Um, in terms of the other pests, um, they're, they're really, as far as I've been able to tell with our apple trees, you know, we'll have things that may be more aesthetic. Um, they don't really affect um, the quality of, of edibility of the fruit. And, and but for instance, we don't spray for, for spot or anything like that or any other insects. And you know, I we, I found that like you, you know, I have lots of things that love love our um, apple trees. We have a lot of ladybugs, and we have a lot of other predaceous insects as well as the birds. And I think that you know, especially if you can increase, and I don't know what what your place looks like or what you have, but the 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 more um, diversity you have in the types of woody plants you have in terms of their vertical structure, um, the type of habitat they offer, the the more complex your landscape is the more wild beneficial wildlife you'll bring in and that helps with your pest control so we have about an acre where i live um, it's on a family farm and an acre of the, of, of the farm is is landscaped and i don't use anything except for those two sprays for the apple trees i don't use fertilizer i don't use pesticides of any sort um, and the system just kind of takes care of itself except for the coddling moth and the apple maggots and and the arborist wood mulch and oh, I can't forget those. <laughs> you can't forget those which are helping to make your trees healthy and healthier trees. Again, I have a podcast on this. Healthier trees have been proven to be more resistant to pests. So, you know, you can't, you can't lose here. Um, we have a special guest coming, but let's stick in. Let's sneak in one extra question here. This one's from Brad. Love the radio show. So much information that we're learning do we water less with mulch? Yes, you will. And I'm going to preface that though with saying that you have to be cautious how you water. So we use pretty thick layers of mulch because we're looking to, to suppress weeds as well as benefit the soil and um, the roots. But you'll notice in the summertime, especially that the top part of your mulch will be dry. And so if you're irrigating from above, it takes quite a bit of water to get the top layer of the mulch hydrated. So what I suggest you do is put down soaker hoses underneath your wood chips if it's an area that needs to be you know, irrigated. And this is what I do in my vegetable garden, for instance. And so I don't water from above, I water from below. It keeps the, the soil saturated, not saturated, it keeps it moist. Um, where it needs to be. But the nice thing about keeping the upper layer of the mulch dry, it means nothing can grow on top of it. So it becomes a very hostile environment to see weed seeds coming in. But underneath that, where the mulch is next to the soil and you've got your drip irrigation if you need it, um, it's moist, it's cool. And so the, the roots of existing plants do really well. So that's part of the way that these deep wood chip mulches keep the weeds out. All right. Well, we've got a special guest on the line today. So I would like Brian. Brian, can you come and join us? This is Brian Kappa of getchipdrop.com. So, you know, 
Well, first of all, Linda, how, how did you know about Brian? Tell me a little bit about your interactions with Brian. Hi. <laughs> well, Welcome as, to the show, Brian. As I recall, and Brian will have to correct me if I'm wrong, um, Brian emailed me um, just out of the blue and said that he was familiar with my work because I think his dad had, had been familiar with my work. And so he was interested in linking you know, to some of my, my publications on using Arbor's chips. And I thought that was great. Um, that not only are they providing this 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 wonderful kind of middleman service to to get uh, chips to people that need them, but also are interested in the science about why they work well. And so here we are with you, Brian, and you tell us about your company, Chip Drop. Tell us what you do. Uh, yeah, thanks, Susan, for having me on the show. And uh, yeah, we're one of Linda's biggest fans. Um, <clears throat> she's correct. My my dad's a master gardener, and I. I believe that's how I heard about her work, but um, <clears throat> we reference Linda's documents all the time whenever we have questions from customers uh, who are asking about wood chip mulch. So yeah, um, we love what she's doing. Um, so yeah, we started, um, my family started Chip Drop back in 2014. Uh, I was previously working as an arborist hauling brush for a tree company, and we are the owner of the company. Uh, had us sort of distributing the wood chips around the neighborhood. And so I just thought it'd be kind of cool if there was an app for that sort of distribution service. And so I started building it over the winter and slowly getting users to sign up for the service uh, here in Port the Portland area is where we're based out of. And then, yeah, it slowly grew from there. And we're in most, most states in the U.S. We're also uh, available in Canada and the U.K., so... So basically, if anybody wants wood chips and, and this app is active, you know, in that neighborhood, like I know that the problem is I've contacted Arborists and say, hey, I'd like some wood chips and they're busy or they're at the other side of the city. So essentially, all I would have to do with Chip Drop is go on the app, say where I live, and one day a truck filled with chips will dump those live, you know, those wood chips right on my front yard. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. I guess I didn't uh, brief on what the service is. It's kind of like a Airbnb matchmaking service for wood chips. Uh, and so, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, the benefits of using chip drop are it's a central distribution system. So you only have to sign up for one service as opposed to, like you said, Susan, calling tree companies in your area, which is still a great way to get wood chips. Um, oftentimes you may see them like working in your neighborhood or working on your street. And if you walk up to them and say, hey, can you drop those wood chips in my yard? They'll probably gladly do so. Um, this is just sort of in some ways, maybe a more reliable way uh, to get those wood chips, although it's it still is on demand because there's no guarantee that a crew will be in your area anytime soon. And it's one of the stipulations of of sort of just getting arborist wood chips is it's just there's no market. You can't just go buy them and get them the next day. You kind of have to wait for the right opportunity. But chip drop kind of gives you the best uh, best success rate, I guess. Yeah. OK, so how much does it cost? I'm a homeowner. I want I want <clears throat> some wood chips for my whole front yard. It's free. We love promoting uh, free wood chips. So yeah, it's free for gardeners to sign up to get free wood chips. Um, arborists actually pay to use the service um, because it's a business expense for them. It costs them a lot of money and a lot of downtime uh, to to drive to the dump or wherever to, to get rid of those wood chips. So yeah, it's free for gardeners to sign up. Um, but again, that comes with some of the stipulations like you don't know when you're going to get them. Uh, in our service, you can't request a partial load, so you have to take the whole truck load. That could be up to 20 yards, which is a lot. Um, and so there's all these stipulations, uh, which you sort of have to agree to. Um, and then, you know, we work with folks. A lot of folks have uh, hesitation about signing up. And so we give people sort of ideas of ways they could still use the service. Like one good example is uh, going in on a delivery with some neighbors um, because, yeah, 20 yards is is plenty for a lot of smaller urban lots. So finding a neighbor who has a nice big driveway who doesn't mind uh, getting the wood chips, you know, dropped in their driveway is a great way to to get some some of the material. So I know for myself, you know, I have a community orchard that's in a public park. 
what we could do if we ever use chip drop, which I am considering, is we could organize you guys, you know, chip drop or the, the local arborist to deposit the chips in the park. The thing is, we can't leave those chips forever because they'll kill the grass and the park supervisor will not be happy. So you don't necessarily get advance notice. So we'd then have to go on email saying, oh my gosh, guys, the chips have been delivered. Let's go mulch our trees and put it out to the neighborhood. Come get wood chips. So just to put it out there that that's a possibility for people. Um, I really wanted to share this because I, I felt it's such a wonderful opportunity to get free, good quality wood chips. However, saying that in the beginning of this show, I talked about my concerns. I would not want diseased fruit tree wood chips. Using your service, would I be able to say, specify, please, no fruit trees? Uh, yeah, so there's a there's a few uh, options you get when you sign up for the service. One of them is if there's any species that you don't want, uh, you can specify that in your request. We do allow that. Um, you can't request specific species. Like, for example, you couldn't say, I only want maple wood chips, for example, because that would be an impossible request to fill. Um, but you can say, I don't want maple or I don't want uh, these species. You could even say, although it is pretty limiting, you could say, like, I don't want conifer or I don't want deciduous. Um, again, the more more restrictive you are with your request, the less likely you are to get a delivery. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing you can specify is whether or not you want logs. Uh, again, this is a service primarily for arborists and tree companies, and a lot of times they have extra logs that they can't chip that they still need to get rid of. So if you're willing to take some logs and they make, I mean, they make great fixtures in a organic or, a, you know, natural garden setting, they're great homes for bugs. And so they, they do a lot of great things for your garden. But if, if that's something you don't want, if you don't want logs, you can specify that in your request well, as well. That is so fantastic. So to the listeners, what do you think about this idea? What's the website that they would go to to check mm -hmm. it out if they can get it to uh, drop off near them? Yeah, you can go to chipdrop.com and uh, sign up on the website um, and uh, you'll create an account. And then from there, there's some steps to place a request. So it's like there's a couple steps to to actually place your request. And we also have some videos on there, which you should definitely talk, uh, check out because it goes over some of the potential pitfalls. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone knows what to expect because we don't want to deliver lots of wood chips to people who don't want it. So, yeah. I loved the videos. I saw one of the videos saying, this is not for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that video. Well, thanks so much. Hold on the line, Brian. Oh, were you going to oh, say something, I, Linda? I, I was hoping I could put in my two cents for chip drop. I use chip drop because it, it's so popular getting chips where I live. It's really hard to get them. So here's my tips. If you're having problems getting chip drop, wait until there's a good storm and there's a lot of branches and trees down. Then sign up because you're probably going to get something. Secondly, be willing to not just ask for free, but be willing to pay. So it costs our arborist, I think, $20 um, to use the service. I offer $40. So they get their $20 and they get their $20, $20 more. Dollars. And if you happen to, um, if it works for you with bribery, sometimes I offer them um, a beer or something like that. <laughs> Come out. So I, I have no problems getting chips now, even though it's highly popular, just offering the extra money so their, their costs are covered and they might earn a free bucks too. Well worth it. Yeah. Brian, the, what do you think about that? Uh, 20, no, an extra 20 bucks under the table. Then is absolutely, she's our biggest uh, advocate. I love this. Uh, she, um, she, no, she's absolutely right. So even though this is a paid service for <clears throat> arborists, gardeners can, uh, we call it a donation, but really you can opt to pay. And it's sort of, gives you priority in the sense that the arborist won't have to pay if you offer to pay as a gardener. So yes, there is an option to do that. Uh, the other tip I wanted to mention too is um, the gardening season generally is just very seasonal. And so if you're willing to place a request uh, during the winter months, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, you will definitely get a delivery in a short amount of time. And that's great if you're planning to mulch in the spring, for example. Now, March, April, we're getting into the really peak high demand times. So um, again, you can pay to maybe get a delivery quicker, um, but you might just have to wait a little bit longer in the spring and summer months, but just some another thing to keep in mind. I'm so glad you joined us, Brian. Let's have, uh, we've got just a few more minutes. I, I have a couple more questions here that came in, Linda, that I wanna try and squeeze in. 
Um, and this one is, is from Bonnie, who writes, Orchard People is the best show. I have a ton of firewood that I do not use anymore. Can I just put that wood in a chipper and make my own mulch? Thanks from Toronto, Ontario. Absolutely. You can you can chip up any wood you have. Now, if you have a chipper and you have to, of course, cut the firewood down to actually to actually chip it well. But there's a couple problems. So if you're chipping stuff yourself and you're doing it with dry wood, it's kind of rough on the chipper because it's a lot harder to chip dry wood than it is to chip relatively live wood. Um, but for instance, we, you know, you could you could chop it up somehow and probably get someone to chip it. Maybe Brian has a better idea than I do. But yes, you can absolutely use it. It's not as great as Arbus wood chips, but it's still untreated wood, which will become part of a decent mulch. Yeah, I, I think the material is totally fine. You're, you're going to have a heck of a time actually chipping if it's already cut to length. Um, that's one thing is like short rounds and short logs, even with the like toughest industrial chippers are really hard. Um, they prefer to chip like longer branches. So I might say to like post it on Craigslist. Um, the other thing you can do, I'm not an expert in, in it, but uh, hugo culture um, or burying the wood. Um, Linda might have more information about this, but you can actually just bury sticks and wood in the ground and that will start to create some, you know, some biological processes happening. So you have a few options. Linda, do you want to comment on that hugo culture? Well, I do have a fact sheet on it, and it's not a process that has any science behind it. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry to burst that one. Um, is it bad? It, is well, it, bad? it can be, sure, because as it decomposes, then you've got your entire landscape is shifting and, and, and settling as it decomposes. So there's 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 some issues with it. Plus, it will create a nitrogen deficiency in the soil, too. Okay, don't do Hugo. I take back. That was a, that was a, a setup. That was a quiz, actually. I was quizzing Linda, and she passed, so. Excellent <laughs> strategy, Brian. Brian, I'm really glad we have you here for quality control and our information. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I did a show as well on hookah culture. I find it interesting. Um, yeah, so people might want to listen to that for some more information. But, you know, again, if there's no studies, then studies need to be done, for heaven's sakes. It should be studied. So I can't believe this. There's three minutes left for the show, Linda. How is that even possible? Didn't we just start three minutes ago? Feels like it. It, went really it feels like it. It definitely feels like it. And Brian, I want to thank both of you guys for coming on the show today. We've got to wrap up for now. Um, but is there just briefly, can each of you share a URL, a website where people can can get more information? And I will add that if you go to podcast dot orchardpeople.com you you can open up this episode i will have lots of links in this episode so you can find brian's chip drop you can find all sorts of great articles that linda has shared with me um but yeah briefly each of you guys can you give me a url to share go ahead linda. Brian. oh oh, oh uh, chipdrop.com yeah uh go to chipdrop.com uh check it out you might find some of linda's articles in our faq or expectations section um but yeah check out chipdrop.com and for me i think the easiest way to find my stuff um two ways if you if you google all in one word informed gardener you'll get to my website which i have a whole bunch of free downloadable pdfs and the other place to find uh stuff that i do our blog and our facebook um, group is if you google all one word again garden professors and that'll get you to our blog and if you're on facebook you can find our facebook page and our facebook group both with garden professors. And it's a great place uh, to have discussions, especially the group. Spicy conversations. For those of us who are like used to traditional gardening information, it will warp your mind. Just going to visit <laughs> there, you may agree, you may disagree, but uh, what can we say? It's good, it's wonderful, wonderful information. Well, thanks everybody. For those of you who've tuned into this episode, I am so glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening on realityradio101.com. Thank you so much for those of us who joined us on YouTube. Would you like me to do a YouTube live again? Was that fun for you guys? I don't know. Please tell me in the YouTube chat. Um, if you want to learn more about today's topic, here's what you do. You can go over to the Orchard People YouTube channel. And in a day or so, I will be posting a video version of this podcast that will have some pictures to illustrate what we have talked about. Uh, you can go to Apple Podcasts or your local podcatcher, and you can search for, search for Orchard People. That's our podcast. 
um, and you can get more of them. There's lots of episodes. This is episode 102. So we've got lots of information packed episodes. And finally, you can go to orchardpeople.com slash sign dash up and sign up for my mailing list. Every month I will send you an email telling you what the that month's live radio show and podcast is going to be about. I will send you links to seasonal articles on how to care for your fruit trees. So hopefully we will keep in touch. Thank you everybody for joining me and I hope to see you all again next month in the show. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Orchard People with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101.